Jesus is the Savior. Jesus is the King. Amen? Amen. Anybody excited to be in church today at all? Anybody love Jesus at all? Merry Christmas. Come on. Let's go. Okay, so um, let's begin here. Uh, A year ago, almost exactly, is a year ago yesterday, actually, um, the final episode of season two of The Mandalorian came out. What a great day. Amen. What a great day. Um, Now, in that episode, and you need to follow me on this, uh, hopefully you had your coffee. In in this final episode, the Mandalorian and Baby Yoda, I won't call him by the other name, Baby Yoda, they get trapped inside this spaceship. And they're like in a cockpit kind of a situation, and they're these monster kind of robots that they can't defeat, okay, which is a big deal. And they're trapped inside of this cockpit area. You think all is lost, all is dark, it's about to go bad. And then somebody shows up. A spaceship comes flying in and docks. Do you know who it was? Some of you know who it was. It was Luke Skywalker. Of course it was. And the lightsaber comes out, and he slices through those robots like they're butter, amen? And it was awesome. It was just awesome. And he saves the day, and everything goes great. We sometimes get in a bad spot, and we want a savior. You see what I just did there? When Frodo and the Hobbits, sounds like a boy band, doesn't it? When Frodo and the Hobbits ever got into trouble... They couldn't fix it. What did they want to have? Who did they want to show up? Gandalf. If Gandalf would just show up, he can defeat any monster. He can solve any problem. He knows which way to go next. All we need is a savior. Even in Harry Potter, who do you want to show up? Professor Dumbledore. Every time. For six books, that's what we wanted, right? Because if we could just have the savior, we'd be okay. Even you sports people, and I don't understand you, but even you sports people, if you're a Chicago Bull and you're in trouble, who do you want to show up? Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan. Because if we could only have him, everything would be great. Pick a sports team, it's a different athlete, amen? We need saviors. We want saviors. Because we're fearful and we're broken and we're stuck, and they can come and fix us. So here's a Christmas question for you. Why do we need a baby? Why do we need a baby? Why do we need a baby at Christmas in a manger? Why do we need Bethlehem at all? Is Christmas just some kind of sad origin story to Jesus? No. I mean, I like Easter, right? Easter's a great holiday. Jesus dies on the cross for our sins, saves humanity, conquers, triumphs over the evil one, comes marching out of the tomb, alive, victorious. Isn't it awesome? That's a great holiday. But that's Easter. Why do I need Christmas? Why do I need a baby? Why didn't God just save some time, bring him straight down as a 30-year-old adult, teach us a few things, right? Walk on water a couple times, raise the dead, heal the sick, go straight to the cross. More efficient, right? Shorter story. Why didn't God do that? Ask yourself the question, why do we need a baby? I've been asking myself that question. I think God gave me part of the answer when I was actually over with Austin at Lovesick Ministries Um, and I'm looking around their facility and I'm seeing a lot of stuff there and they're super effective in what they're doing, but this facility's made out of cinder block and it's a little rough around the edges. I'll just say that even the pews that they've got around their stage, which I love by the way, the pews are are like they're hand me down old used pews from three different churches and none of them match. And I'm looking around at all these different things, and I'm like, you know, my pastor's eyes are looking, and I'm like, I know what I'd do there, I know what I'd do there, I know what I'd do there. And Austin, I think he could sense it in me, and he says this, he's like, you know, there are people that come here 
that wouldn't come to your place. Right? And he's like, he's like, as much as we add some things and fix some things, he's like, I don't want the character and feel of this place to ever change. He's like, because there's some people who haven't had a shower in a while, and I'm not sure they'd go to Grace Fellowship. There's some people that might be showing up with their shopping cart. I'm not sure they'd feel comfortable going to Grace Fellowship. And so I need to make sure this congregation is ready for the people that God is sending me. Woo! <sighs> Can you see the bigger principle, though, for us? I'd say it this way. If your hospital doesn't look like me, I'm probably not coming. And if your Savior isn't like me, I'm probably not coming to him either. Isn't that humanity? Isn't there part of you that showed up here because you felt like you might be welcome here? And there were certain qualities, and we all need those qualities. So as I'm talking to you, and I'm, I'm preaching this message to all of you, you probably slept in a warm bed last night. So we got to come from that vantage point for the, rest of it, for the rest of this. I'd say here's, here's the problem with saviors, Michael Jordan and all of them. They can save us, but I don't know if they can understand us. They can save us, but I don't know if we can relate to them. They're not one of us. They feel like they're outside. Like you might call them in a pinch. But are you going to confess your sin to them? Are they going to be your friend? Are you going to be close? See, Jesus is a different kind of savior because he came as a baby. See, those are the ones that are almost too great. And so when we're ugly and when we've done too much bad stuff and we're ashamed, we won't go to saviors like those saviors, but maybe we'll go to Jesus. The baby came in a manger Cute, quiet, helpless. The baby came in a manger. Innocent, vulnerable. You ever go to pick up a baby? A baby just give it, gives itself to you. The scripture says, unto us a son is born. Unto us a child is given. Right? He came as a baby, and I think he came as a baby so he could experience every single part of our human life, and he could live in our skin, and I think that's the essential quality. Why did a baby come at Christmas, and why do we celebrate it? Because he's not just a savior, he's one of us. Jesus Christ is Emmanuel, God with us. We're really good at the God part, we forget the second. With us. He is God with us. That's not geographical proximity with us. Walked in our shoes, knows us, gets it. Say gets it. Say gets it. He gets it. Jesus Christ filled his diaper. Probably a lot. Yes, he cried. Sometimes, seemingly, for no reason. <laughs> the cattle are lowing. The poor baby wakes. But little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. That's not true. And, and don't we do that? I, I'm not saying anybody's trying to, trying to be mean or trying to be wrong. But things like that happen. And what we do is we try to probably for the right motives, but we, we find ourselves trying to clean up the Christmas story. Don't wash the humanity out. I think the humanity helps us. Don't put the halos around the heads because what that does at the end of the day is it creates distance between us and the Savior. So you got to know he was human because he's Emmanuel. He could have just been God. He chose to be God with us. And it matters to us today. I believe he struggled to take his first steps. I think he was sick. I think he had a fever. He might have even had allergies. 
He didn't skip the toddler phase or the grade school phase. Maybe he struggled with math. Thank God it was not common core math. Amen? Yeah. <sighs> maybe he struggled. Maybe, maybe the little girls laughed at him. Maybe he wondered why. Maybe he was awkward. Maybe, maybe he went through the awkward stage. Maybe he had a hard time. He was from a poor family. Some of you guys were from poor families. You remember that time there wasn't food in the house and there wasn't enough money and you skipped a, skipped a meal. In America, that's a scandal. You skipped a meal. I wonder if Jesus skipped a meal. I'm guessing he did. I bet he wore hand-me-down Nazarene clothes, not the fancy stuff. Welcome to our broken life, Jesus. He had to live it. He could have skipped 30 years of that and just come down as a fully formed adult. But he would have missed 30 years of living in our skin. He needed to. Even when he's an adult, he was accused of being insane. People misunderstood him. People didn't believe in him. People accused him. People arrested him. Think of those things. He was betrayed by one of his closest friends. Have you ever been betrayed before? By someone that you loved? You ever been rejected by people like he was rejected? How many times would Jesus show up if you let him at certain points in your life and say, I know just how that feels? It's funny, like, was it last week we were talking about parenting? It's, it's been a long time. <laughs> but I remember we were talking about the baby stage. And there was a part of me inside, I'm like, I shouldn't be talking about the baby stage. It's been years since I've done the baby stage. Don't you hate it when people come up to you, you folks that are in the baby stage right now, and they offer you advice, and you're like, that was like 30 years ago for you. You don't know anything anymore. <laughs> and they're right. You don't feel the pressure in the same way anymore. But here's the thing. Jesus has got perfect God-like memory, does he not? So I don't care how long ago it was, he remembers it like it was yesterday. All of it. So he remembers the betrayal. He remembers being in jail. He remembers being beaten and tortured and finally dying for us. He remembers all of it. And so when you walk through these things, realize that you love a Savior today who went through it and remembers it. Of all the human lives he could have lived, he lived a hard one. Hebrews 5, chapter 2 says he was weak just like we are. Look at this. <laughs> it says, and he is able to deal gently with ignorant and wayward people. That's us, by the way. Sorry. Ignorant and wayward, maybe both. Because he himself is subject to the same weaknesses. He went through all the weaknesses that we go through. And because of that, it says... Because of that, he's inclined to deal gently with us. Are you glad you got a gentle savior today? Who's well motivated because he gets it. And he realizes your life. Uh, my, my final year in seminary, I did my senior research project on the high priest in the Old Testament. And that sounds heady, right? But it's on the high priest in the Old Testament. You know what the first qualification was for the Jewish high priest in the Old Testament? They had to be from among the people. You couldn't, if you wanted them to be a Jewish high priest, it had to be someone who grew up in, amongst the Jewish people because they had to get it. Because if they got it, they deal gently with you. And so when God looks at Jesus, he's got to be from among us. The next verse, Hebrews 5, 8, he had to suffer and learn like us. Even though Jesus was God's son, he learned obedience from the things that he suffered. In this way, God qualified him as a perfect high priest. That'll mess with your theology. Jesus learned. There were some things Jesus needed to learn experientially. He needed to learn, and he learned them through his suffering. You ever suffer and then learn a good lesson through it? Jesus knew what that process was like. He embraced that process. Next, he was tempted in every way. We are Hebrews 4, 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. He gets it. 
but one who is in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Not just tempted a couple times, not just tempted in a couple areas, tempted in every single area. Again, that should mess with your theology a bit. Jesus went through it. And because he's one of us, he gets us. Psalm 103, verse 8. The Lord is compassionate and merciful, slow to anger, filled with unfailing love. This is a great section of scripture. You should love this. He has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him, for he knows how weak we are. He remembers we are only dust. Jesus Christ remembers today how weak Josh Trueblood is. He remembers that I'm only dust. I'm not, I'm not that perfect person I'd like to be. I'm not, I'm not any of this that maybe I project. I'm dust. Amen? Oh, I can relax in that. I love a God who knows me, gets me. So this should change you. Let's get to the application. This should change you. See, Jesus bought this for you, by the way. There's a, there's a verse in Philippians 2. It says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross and he despised the shame. Do you remember that? For the joy that was set before him. Jesus had this way. He didn't let the current circumstances get to him. He focused on something. And that's how he got through hard times. He focused on something. He focused on the joy that was set before him. Do you know what the joy was? Number one, it was pleasing God the Father who had given him the mission. But number two, it was the fact that he was going to save all mankind. But number three, I believe, for the joy set before him, it was the fact that he, was, he knew he was securing friendship with us if we wanted it. Actual friendship. There's a spot when Jesus looks at the disciples and he says, I don't call you servants. I don't call you slaves. He said, I call you friends. You're meant to be the friend of God. Right? That's part of it. Some of you tried out Christianity, you've tried out church, you've tried out Bible, and it never really stuck, never really worked, never really helped. And, and for many of you, you didn't get to the friendship stage with God. You're meant to be the friend of God. And the basis of this friendship is you have to know he's a savior who gets you. He gets it today. He's one of us. Welcome to our world, Jesus. So how does this work out? Number one, he's not disgusted by you. It, and this is the spot that's kind of about our sin, right? Like, not only did Jesus die on the cross for our sins. Oh, huge. You, what a blessing. Amazing grace that I get to be forgiven and no longer caught up in my past and my shame. Jesus gives me all of that. But also just the fact that he's not like legally obligated to love me. He isn't disgusted by me. So explore that a little bit. See, he grew up with a sinful family, right? Jesus had little brothers. Did you know that? So he, on a day in, day out basis, he put up with little brothers. Anybody here got a little brother? Do they sin? Do they sin a lot? Heck yeah, they do. Right? And it's, and it's selfishness and it's cruelty and it's anger and it's all the things. And so he had to see all that stuff up close and put up with it and still love little brother. See, sometimes we, we come to God to confess our sins, right? And, and we put God in two categories. See if, see if this makes sense to you. So we'll either put God in, in the uh, uh, bumbling grandpa category and he's like really, really far away and happy. And, and we say, oh, God, forgive me my sins. And he kind of winks at you and says, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> right? Because he doesn't really know. And he doesn't really get close. He's just like, ah, it's fine. So bumbling grandpa. Or we'll come to God and we'll come to him like that really strict teacher who red penned you to death in school and looked at every tiny little thing that you did wrong and went after you for it. And God's either here or he's here. And Jesus is neither. Jesus is the one who knew up close what it was to really love sinful people. And sinful people where he saw the sin and he lived with it. 
but he loved them anyway. And so when we come to God, can we come to him and realize that he is not shocked by us? Some of you are afraid God's going to be shocked by you. Nope. He'll not be surprised, not be disgusted, and not angry with you. He died on the cross so he wouldn't have to be. Amen? Loves you. The next thing that our Savior does for us is he allows us to pray to somebody who gets it. See, if you understand who Jesus is, you'll pray differently. You're supposed to pray differently. I mean, just the friendship comes right into your prayer life. So you don't say prayers. You talk to a friend. You talk to God as if he is your friend. And you talk to God as if he's so much your friend. He's a person who understands exactly what you're talking about. Like he gets it, gets it, gets it. So like, Jesus, I'm dealing with chronic pain today. And I know I'm talking to somebody who understands what pain feels like. Do you see how that would instantly change your prayer life? God, I'm so lonely today. I feel like I've got nobody in this world. I feel like nobody sees me. I've got nobody to celebrate Christmas with. I'm going to be alone, Jesus. And you understand what loneliness feels like. It changes everything. God, I can't figure life out, and I'm spinning all these plates, and I don't know how to keep spinning them, and they're starting to fall down, and I don't know how to make life work. But Jesus, you came into humanity, and you somehow made life work. And you understand the stress of all this. And would you help me? Would you be the kind of God who helps me? And it goes on and on and on. Jesus, here's my sin, and God, I'm full of sin today, but Lord, you loved people who are full of sin, so maybe you could love me. And it just, it changes it all. Amen? Third thing, he's easy to run to. Okay, imagine a situation. Imagine you did something really, really bad. And I mean, just destroy your life bad. It's not public yet. So what you're going to do, before it becomes public, you're going to go and you're going to tell that person. Who are you going to tell? You're going to go and you're going to tell them, right? Because you've you got to tell somebody you got to start to process it with somebody. Hopefully, they'll accept you. Hopefully, they'll be the first person that accepts you. Who's that person? Family member, sibling, friend? Who are you going to run to? Get a name in your mind. See, you've got a name and you've got that person. You know who that person is? They're the person who's not going to judge you. They're the person who gets you. That's who you're thinking of. We ought to run to Jesus. See, he came and he lived in our shoes to be our friend. And we do this thing with God, don't we? We stay in our dark corner and we don't tell him because we're afraid to go tell him. We're afraid to bring him in. We're afraid to be real with him because he's way out there and he's got a halo above his head. Run to Jesus. Emmanuel, realize he understands. Last piece, can I ask you, in the final moments that we have together, could you look at Christmas in a whole new way? Why did we need a baby? What's this story really all about? I'm going to read Luke 2 again. We read it before. I'm going to read it to you in a slightly different translation. And I just want you to see the whole thing. I want you to see the shepherds and the angels and the, the manger and the everything. I want you to see it through a different lens. Jesus is coming toward you. It's a verse in the Old Testament that says, The word is near to you, it is in your heart, it's on your lips. It's not way up in heaven, it's not way down in the depths. The word is near to you. This is Luke 2. So there were shepherds camping in the neighborhood, and they set night watches over their sheep, and suddenly God's angel stood among them, and God's glory blazed around them, and they were terrified, the shepherds were. These are like blue-collar guys. The angel said, don't be afraid. I'm here to announce a great and joyful event that is meant for everybody worldwide. A Savior has been born in David's town, a Savior who is Messiah and Master. And this is what you're going to look for. You're going to look for a, a baby wrapped in a blanket, lying in a manger, in a barn. 
And as the angel choir withdrew into heaven, the shepherds talked it over. Let's get over to Bethlehem as fast as we can and see for ourselves what God has revealed to us. And so they left running and they found Mary and Joseph, mom and dad, and the baby lying in the manger. Seeing was believing. And they told everyone they met that what the angels had said about this child and all who heard the shepherds were impressed. Don't miss this last one. But Mary kept all these things to herself and she held them dear, deep within herself. Some translations say, say deep in her heart. All the memories watching her boy grow up. Would you guys stand? I wanna pray for us. Lord Jesus, thank you for coming, Lord. God, we needed you to come. God, I don't know how this would have worked any other way. Because God, I don't just want to be saved today, Lord. I, I want you to be my friend. I want, I want to be the friend of God. And so, Lord, I need to tell you my secrets. I need to tell you my sins. I need to reach out to you. God, thank you that you are somebody who gets it and understands. Emmanuel, God with us. Feels almost impossible in, in the busyness of this holiday right now. But Lord, you can come in and with all the, all the stuff going on, you can change our hearts and you can help us understand Jesus in a whole new way. I pray that you would. But for those of us, God, we're just not there yet on friendship with you. God, I pray that you would, you would pull us into that place, that you would show us how. Pray that we would find ourselves praying in the car. We would find ourselves praying between meetings, God. We find ourselves talking to you like a friend, not just saying prayers, Lord, but talking to Jesus. Take us to a new place, Lord. We love you. In Christ's name, amen.